<laughs> that was the best possible way to do that. Just instead of turning your head. It's like getting a fix, dude. My hit of tea. I'm like, oh, I'm ready to go. Vroom. Salutations. And welcome back to Idea Sex, where we take an analytical lens to mysticism and spirituality. Today, we're talking about the ego because I realized it's sort of fundamental to everything we talk about on the channel and I keep referencing it and we've sort of talked about it, but I've never made a video about it. So now is the time. The ego, what the heck is it? Depends on who you ask. Uh, in psychoanalysis and psychology, it means something very different than the way we use it today, right? The way Freud use it, used it is very different than the way I use it. When I'm driving around Arizona and I see some dude in a big bro dozer, you know those trucks with like the raised wheels and the, the metal nut sacks hanging off the ends? I say he has a big ego and it means something very different than the way that Freud used it when he was talking about the ego as being a mediator between the superego and the id. And then in spiritual circles, ego means something completely different than, than both of these two things in spirituality. The ego is like the self-image. You know, we have our true self. And then we have an identity that we build up over the course of, of certain life experiences. And our ego is essentially who we think we are, right? It's the labels we attach to ourselves. It's the categories we put ourselves into. And above all, it is the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And so the way the ego manifests is as the voice in our head that never shuts the hell up, right? We all have that internal dialogue that's constantly going. And for a lot of people, we're not even aware of this until we pick up something like meditation. This is how I became aware of the ego. I was at a meditation camp, at a silent medica med medication camp. <laughs> Meditation camp for the better. It was. It was like medication for my soul. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, I was at the silent meditation camp in Thailand for, for 10 days, and it was the most annoying thing to become aware of um, my self talk because it really is like background noise until you start to hear it. And for me, I was like, How did you get in here? Like, I didn't give you permission. You're awful. Leave. And so when someone asks you the question, Who are you? Most of us are gonna answer with like, I am fill in the blank. And really the answer is I am, those are the magic words, but I am, and then you know your name, or uh, I am religious beliefs. I am, insert your political beliefs. I am, uh, this, is, this is what I do for work, right? And this is how we identify. But is that who we really are? In the words of Eckhart Tolle, we are the watcher behind the thinker, and the thinker is the ego. It's the part of us that's telling stories about who we are, that's assigning us labels, almost like cliques in high school. You know, um, if, you were, if you were in AP classes, then you're, you might say, I'm a nerd. If you uh, were on a sports team, I'm an athlete. If you were in theater, uh, I'm, I'm a creative or a weirdo, whatever. And these things are, may have meaning to us contextually, but what do they really mean, right? Like you may be the valedictorian in your high school class of 300 and you think you're a friggin' genius. And then you go to an Ivy League with tens of thousands of kids just like you. And now you're not the valedictorian. Are you still, are you still smart? Like, see, these things are just labels. And you start to realize in a situation like that how flimsy they become. Becoming aware of the ego is a game changer because when we realize that we're not our thoughts, we can then rewire those thoughts and everything in our life, like the way we behave, the way we interact with people, uh, what we believe is possible for us is all a result of our thoughts and beliefs. And because the, the ego, the ego is a very negative entity when it's unchecked. And Eckhart Tolle, who's written probably more about the ego than, than anyone else that I know of, um, in A New Earth, he makes the point that the ego is the reason that the problems that exist in the world exist today, because uh, we're operating from this part of our mind that is very fearful and divisive. And so, yeah, on one hand, all the ego is doing 
is telling stories, but unfortunately, a lot of these stories become negative. And so we're going to take a look today at the, uh, the neuroscience of the ego and why I happen to disagree with a lot of spiritual authors about what the role of the ego is. People like Eckhart Tolle will tell you that we need to transcend uh, the ego, that we sort of need to, to kill it with righteous fire. And I'm of the mind that nature doesn't fuck up. You know, everything that's in us is in us for a reason. And rather than trying to like get rid of it, um, instead bringing it back into alignment so that it is in service to us and not in control of us. My definition of the ego is a little different because I have taken a lot of spiritual teachings and cross-referenced them with neuropsychology to come up with something that made sense to me because in the spiritual teachings, you know, it's, it's all about like, you wanna kill the ego with righteous fire so that you can become like Jesus. And that just never seemed possible for me personally. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if there's a way that I can like seek to understand this part of my mind and then maybe just not let it uh, rule my life. And so in, in looking at neuropsychology, it confirmed this idea that I had about, you know, this is actually an essential piece of our brain. Uh, what we call the ego is really a manifestation of left brain consciousness, which we'll get into. And it's critical for us to be able to like function in society like normal human beings. Uh, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Yes, the ego can wreak all kinds of havoc and make all kinds of storms in our lives, but ultimately, it is an outgrowth of this totally natural and essential part of ourselves. And the book that really put this into, uh, th that brought this all into place for me was No Self, No Problem, How Neuropsychology is Catching Up to Buddhism. And in it, Chris Niebauer shows us how the left brain uh, is a lot like the ego as it's talked about in spirituality. This book will explore strong evidence suggesting that the concept of the self is simply a construct of the mind rather than a physical thing located somewhere within the brain itself. Put another way, it is the process of thinking that creates the self rather than there being a self having any independent existence separate from thought. The self is more like a verb than a noun. To take it a step further, the implication is that without thought, the self does not in fact exist. It's as if contemporary neuroscience and psychology are just now catching up to what Buddhist, Taoist, and Advaita Vedanta Hinduism have been teaching us for over 2,500 years. The part that really jumps out to me here is, to take it a step further, the implication is that without thought, the self does not, in fact, exist. Uh, because we think we're those stories that we tell ourselves in our head, right? The, that mental chatter, we like, we're like, oh, that's, that's me. I am that voice. Um, and... This book is built on the premise that thinking arises from our left brain. And so really, and this is not talked about in this book, but we have reason to believe there's a growing body of evidence that would suggest that the brain, the way it operates is, is holographic, which is magical, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Idea sex for another time, not that rabbit hole. Um, and so the way the brain is traditionally talked about is it's divided into the left and right hemispheres. And that's what he talks about here. And we're gonna lean into that today because most of us have this idea that uh, you know our left brain is our logical analytical half and our right brain is our like creative intuitive half. Important note, our left brain is also our linguistic center, meaning it uses language to communicate. This is how we process words because our left brain uh, is a master at pattern recognition. And when we're reading words, these are, these are just patterns, right? And we can string them together. We can string letters into sentences um, that, that make stories. And this is how our left brain understands the world. So it is our linguistic center. And because it thinks in words, this is what we are hearing when we're talking about the ego, when we're talking about that mental narration. The right brain uh, understands words which they've proved in, in split brain testing, but it communicates in imagery and it communicates in emotions, which is why it's our intuitive center. And so I've come to define the ego as uh, unchecked, it's an outgrowth of unchecked left brain consciousness. It's when we become imbalanced between these two things that the ego becomes problematic. And we'll get into how that happens, but for now, suffice to say that we have these two hemispheres of our brain they're both important, right? Like we both, we need both of them to function, but uh, we currently live in a society 
where we're much more in left brain consciousness and it can create a lot of problems when that happens. So let's get a little more on what the left and right brain consciousness are and then we'll talk about why the ego is, is, is so, so rascally can cause so many problems, all the problems. You don't have 99 problems, you have one, and it's the ego. <laughs> all right. In many ways, the right brain is the yin to the yang of the left brain. For instance, in the same way that the left brain is categorical, the right brain takes a more global approach to what it perceives. Rather than dividing things into categories and making judgments that separate the world, the right brain gives attention to the whole scene and processes the world as a continuum. Whereas the attention of the left brain is focused and narrow, the right brain, the right brain is broad, vigilant, and attends to the big picture. Whereas the left brain focuses on the local elements, the right brain processes the global form that the elements create. The left brain is sequential, separating time into before that or after this, while the right brain is focused on the immediacy of the present moment. The experience uh, of the present moment. Another way to summarize, another way to summarize the differences between the left and right brain is that the left brain is the language center and the right brain is the spatial center. While admittedly this is reductive, it is a helpful way to summarize decades of research. Language is categorical. It looks at uh, one word at a time with a narrow focus either as you read or as you speak. When we process the space around us, we deal with the whole at once, not individual parts, but how the parts are all connected as they are in any picture. I don't know about you, but to me, both of those things sound important, the left and, and the right half. And I, like, personally, I wanna keep both halves of my brain, thanks. And so I think from just reading that, it doesn't totally tell us why the ego or left brain consciousness can be a bad thing. And this is why I say it's when the left brain is unchecked, uh, when it thinks it's in charge, the left, Brain consciousness makes a good servant and a terrible master. And here's why. When the left brain is in charge, we tend to think that our beliefs reflect reality. And this can be, a, I think, a difficult realization to realize that a belief is just a belief. It isn't total reality. And when we hold on to a belief like it is entirely real, this is where we get ourselves into trouble. And so let's use, I think a great example is um, slavery. And, and specifically, as it, we'll talk about it as it um, pertains to the United States, because slavery has existed in cultures all over the world. Um, but this one, uh, we're seeing in very real ways the repercussions as it, as it continues to play out in ways today. And so when we think about enslaving an entire race of people, it started with a thought. It started with a category, right? Which is what the left brain does. It categorizes things. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, differentiating white, black, Asian, Hispanic. Um, it's one thing to notice a difference and know that people come from a certain culture, right? The problem comes with when we start telling stories about those categories, right? And so in the case of white colonialist slaveholders, they told a story. The label is, I'm white, you're black, and um, I'm gonna tell these stories about how you're less intelligent, you're inferior, uh, and it is completely acceptable for me to treat you like an animal, um, less than an animal, really. And Today, we know that, that the, the entire premise that slavery was built on is false, but that was a story that was told by a thought, by our ego. So again, the problem is not the categories, right? There's nothing wrong with I am this race and you are that race. Uh, there's nothing wrong in that observation. The problem is when we start telling stories, damaging stories about these categories. Uh, and that raises the question, why is the ego intent on telling stories that are hurtful? harmful, detrimental, judgmental, in a really like negative way that helps no one. And to understand this, we have to understand what the ego is afraid of. The ego is afraid of nothing more than its own demise. It thinks it's all you got. And it's like, when I'm gone, because this is who we think we are, right? Is the voice in our head. When that's gone, what's left? And it can be an uncomfortable thing to contemplate because we realize when we go through that little exercise of, oh, who am I? 
when that voice is gone, we realize what we're contemplating is physical death. And again, the ego thinks that that's, that's what you are. You're the voice in your head. And so uh, it thinks that when it's gone, it's over. Like you've been obliterated. It's the end. What actually happens when the networks in our brain that are associated with identity go offline? There's been quite a few studies on this. Uh, I'll give you two that I think make the point really well. So the first is in um, a study on Buddhist monks and Franciscan nuns, they would enter intense prayer and meditation. And when they reached the peak of their practice, networks in their brain that were associated with identity would go offline. In other words, they, they experience what's called ego death. And uh, the monks call this samadhi or absolute unitary being. The Franciscan nuns call it uh, unio mystica or oneness with God's love, which I think is beautiful. And this experience is one that's described as blissful, um, deeply peaceful, oneness with the universe. And it's in this experience that people realize they are part of something infinitely bigger. Uh, there was another, well, it was more of a, a case study than a study study, but there was a, a neuroanatomist who suffered a stroke. And, uh, you know, as a neuroanatomist, not only are you studying the brain, but you're very much operating in, in left brain consciousness. It's a, it's a very analytical kind of field. And so when her brain goes offline, she's not able to she experiences the stroke. It takes years to recover. Her left brain is essentially non-functioning. It's offline. And uh, what she experienced was, again, this sort of like feeling of being at one with the universe. And she talks about how she no longer perceived things as like super divided categories, um, like where things ended and, and where other things began, but rather everything seemed to be a part of everything else. And it was experienced on a continuum. These studies have a couple of really interesting implications. First is that physical death may not be as scary as we think it is. And I know in, in those studies, it's just the uh, part of our brain going offline, but those experiences happen to line up really well with the research done on near-death experiences and on out-of-body experiences, all of which point in the direction that uh, we aren't actually these physical bodies. We are a consciousness that is like temporarily incarnated into as well as what we, with what we know about reincarnation, all things we're going to get into on this channel. But suffice to say, the ego is the part of us that does not realize that you are an infinite being. You are a singular expression of a consciousness that will go on exploring itself and expanding for eternity. The other really interesting implication is about right brain. Uh, so we know from those studies that right brain is associated with mystical experiences and, and spiritual experiences and this feeling of being connected with everything, this experience of uh, being one with the universe, right? Samadhi. My guess is that here's, here's the idea I'm playing with. My, my current hypothesis is that things that we previously thought were impossible are done in right brain consciousness. And here's what I mean by that. For example, uh, shamans, have been known to perform healing miracles. Like this is, this is documented. In order to do this, they enter into an altered state of consciousness, can be through trance, drumming, uh, communicating with spirits, can be through uh, plant medicine is probably the one most people are familiar with. And when they do this, they're able to do things that uh, we thought were impossible. Remote viewing is another example, and this is really well documented. The CIA did not spend an, a ridiculous amount of money on studying this in, in Project Stargate um, back in like the 70s or the 80s, whatever, because it didn't work. Remote viewing uh, is, I would say there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's real. And what, in case you're not familiar, remote viewing is when you project your consciousness to another part of the world. So you're not physically there, but you observe it. Um, and we won't get into the, the science of any of this today, but suffice to say, I think that in order to do things like that, we have to be in right brain consciousness. And our ancestors were very much aware of the fact that there is a mystical component to our world, right? The, the, we have these mystical underpinnings to our world. And I think the reason we've lost touch with all of this stuff, because uh, again, magic exists in cultures all over the world throughout history. The reason we've lost touch with this is because we're stuck over here in left brain consciousness. And the left brain does not know 
that magic is real. Th this guy thinks that magic is something you find in at Disneyland, not something that's folded into the fabric of our everyday existence. And so let's get back to the ego and this, this left brain dude uh, who doesn't know that magic exists, who doesn't know that you are an infinite being. When our left brain is not in harmony with our right brain, it thinks it's all you got. Uh, these thoughts, emotions, beliefs, these labels we put on ourselves, these categories we put ourselves into, it's like, this is who you are. And at the same time, some part of us realizes that these things are very precarious, right? A thought is here and then it's gone. An emotion is here and then it's gone. Uh, a material object is here and then it's gone. So the, some part of the ego knows that it's on unsteady ground. It's like, well, this identity isn't really <laughs> very solid. What can I do to build it up in any way possible? And there's a few strategies that it resorts to. One is by making itself superior. So sort of back to the example of slavery, that's a really extreme example, but we can see this in a lot of places where uh, we draw lines between group A and group B, right? This is my group, this is your group. And then we look for ways to elevate our group. We see this in religious institutions, right? Where, where everyone seems to think that they've found the answer and everyone else goes down here. That's the ego. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not truth, that's ego. Um, same thing with politics. Same thing with, oh, everyday life. When people uh, who aren't aware of the ego walk into a room full of other people, they'll size people up and sort of decide where they fall in a pecking order. And this is why people compare um, themselves to each other, right? Women do it a lot on beauty. People will do it on intelligence, on virtue. People will compare themselves on all kinds of things, all right? Where do I rank in relation to this person? Um, and the reason is because we want to find ways to elevate ourselves, and that is purely the ego trying to keep itself alive, right? If it's like, if I have the most and am the most shiny, then I live forever. It's very Gatsby. And that's the other thing that the uh, ego does is because it realizes at some part that this identity is fragile, um, it's constantly reaching to things outside itself to try to bolster itself. And so it gets, it gets very attached to physical objects. And the idea is that um, ownership makes us feel like we are more permanent. And I'll read a quote from Tolle about that. One of the unconscious assumptions of the ego is that by identifying with an object through the fiction of ownership, the apparent solidity and permanency of that object will endow your sense of self with greater solidity and permanency. The ego tends to equate having with being, right? I have, therefore I am. The more I have, the more I am. And this is why some physical objects will feel like they are a part of our self, right? And this is called form identification. Like if you dog ear one of my books, I'm gonna scream. The ego identifies with having, but its satisfaction in having is a relatively shallow and short-lived one. Concealed within it remains a deep-seated sense of dissatisfaction, of incompleteness, of not enough. I don't have enough yet, by which the ego really means I am not enough yet. As we have seen, having, the concept of ownership, is a fiction created by the ego to give itself solidity and permanency and make itself stand out, make itself special. So really, Everything the ego is doing, it's doing to protect us. Um, it's doing to, to keep us alive as it perceives us, right? Us being this collection of, of thoughts and, and beliefs and possessions that make up our, our identity. Um, the ego, of course, failing to realize that we're something much bigger than that. So I know this is an abstract and especially abstract idea. Uh, we're actually just scratching the surface in terms of um, ego and its relation to consciousness. So if you have any specific questions, you know I love to have idea sex with everyone all the time. And I think that's it for today. Until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week and stay blessed. <laughs>